Thank you, Seth, and good morning. We uh, had a break of about two weeks from our studies in Joshua, but we're back in Joshua this morning, and we're picking up where we left off two weeks ago with Joshua chapter 14. I'm going to read the entire chapter, all 15 verses. Now these are the territories which the sons of Israel inherited in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest, and Joshua the son of Nun, and the heads of the households of the tribes of the sons of Israel apportioned to them for an inheritance by the lot of their inheritance as the Lord commanded through Moses for the nine tribes and the half-tribe. For Moses had given the inheritance of the two tribes and the half-tribe beyond the Jordan, but he did not give an inheritance to the Levites among them. For the sons of Joseph were two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim, and they did not give a portion to the Levites in the land except cities to live in with their pasture lands for their livestock and for their property. Thus the sons of Israel did just as the Lord had commanded Moses, and they divided the land. Then the sons of Judah drew near to Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite said to him, You know the word which the Lord spoke to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was forty years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought back to him as it was brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt with fear. But I followed the Lord my God fully. So Moses swore on that day saying, Surely the land on which your foot has trodden will be an inheritance to you and to your children forever because you have followed the word of my God fully. Now behold, the Lord has let me live, just as he spoke these 45 years. From the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses, when Israel walked in the wilderness, and now behold, I am 85 years old today. I am still strong today, as strong today as I was in the day Moses sent me. As my strength was then, so my strength is now, for war and for going out and coming in. Now then, give me this hill country about which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day that the Anakim were there with great fortified cities. Perhaps the Lord will be with me and I will drive them out as the Lord has spoken." So Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, for an inheritance. Therefore Hebron became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, until this day, because he followed the Lord God of Israel fully. Now the name of Hebron was formerly Kiriat Arba, for Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. Then the land had rest from war. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer and seek his blessing on us. Let's pray. Black swan has become something of a buzzword or an expression that's somewhat familiar to us over the past few years, at least to me in the past few years. But it was coined a long time ago in the second century by the Roman poet Juvenal who noted how difficult it is to find a wife with the right virtues. He described her as a bird as rare upon the earth as a black swan. In the poet's time, the only swans that were known were white. So it's a person or it's an event that is very rare. Well, later the expression was used in a sermon in the 1500s by 
the English preacher and poet Thomas Drant. He was speaking of the Roman centurion Cornelius, the first Gentile convert. His conversion is recorded in Acts chapter 10. And he described him as a man of rare virtue. Captain Cornelius, he said, is a black swan in this generation. We could say the same of Caleb in our passage in Joshua 14. He was a man of unusual faith and courage, such as is found in very few generations. We would expect to find him in Hebrews 11, the faith chapter. It begins, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, for by it the men of old gained approval. It goes on to give examples of men and women who had faith. Abel, Abraham, Sarah, Moses, and others. But there are names missing from what's often called the Saints Hall of Fame. And one of them is Caleb. If ever a man of the Old Testament gained God's approval by his faith, it was Caleb. The author of Hebrews didn't forget him. He simply ran out of time and space. That's what he said. Time will fail me, he wrote, if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, and others. Well, Caleb has his own faith chapter, and we come to it now in Joshua 14, when he came to Joshua and asked him to give him the hill country where the giants lived. The importance of Caleb and what he did is measured by the fact that three times the account of his taking his inheritance is recorded. It's recorded here in chapter 14, it's recorded in chapter 15, and then it's recorded in chapter 1 of the book of Judges. Chapter 14 begins the account of how the lands west of the Jordan River were divided among the nine and a half tribes of Israel. That uh, continues on until chapter 19. It happened at Gilgal, which was where Israel's base camp was set up when they crossed the Jordan River and entered the land. But, but now the land was conquered. All of the standing armies of the Canaanites had been defeated, its fortresses captured, its kings killed. Israel had a firm foothold in the land. So Joshua, Eleazar the priest, and the elders of the tribes were given the task of dividing the land and distributing it by lot. According to verse 2, this was what the Lord had commanded. Then the tribes of Reuben, the, rather I should say the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh had already received their inheritance on the east side of the Jordan River. Moses had given them that. But now lots would be cast to determine the inheritance of the rest of the nation, the nine and a half tribes that would settle west of the Jordan in Canaan. Uh, and it would begin with the tribe of Judah. Now, as the Lord told Joshua at the beginning of chapter 13, there was still very much land that remained to be possessed. Canaanites were still in the land and they were hostile. There were more battles to be fought. And one of the warriors who was ready and eager to fight and take possession of his portion of the land was Caleb. So he came to Gilgal, where all of this would happen, and he asked for his inheritance. He was the one person who could lay claim to a portion of Canaan because God had promised it to him. And so when the time had come to cast the lots and decide the inheritance, Caleb already knew where his inheritance was, and he approached his friend and fellow comrade in arms, Joshua, to request it. And it was a request that Joshua couldn't refuse. He is identified here as the son of Jephunneh the Kenazite, which has suggested to some 
that Caleb may have been a descendant of the Kenazites, which was a, a Canaanite tribe that's mentioned back in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 19. And that's possible. I'm, I'm sure that there were people of the land who were influenced by the life and witness of Abraham and the patriarchs and converted. When Abraham first came into the land at Shechem, he built an altar and he called upon the name of the Lord. And you read about that periodically in Genesis. And I'm sure that there were those in the land who heard and who believed and were converted. There are notable examples of that all through this early part of the Bible. We've already seen Rahab the harlot, who was, a, who was from um, Jericho. And then there was Ruth the Moabitess and Uriah the Hittite later, godly converts from the Gentiles. So perhaps that is true that Caleb comes from that stock. But I think it's more likely that Caleb was a natural descendant of Judah and that his ancestor was named Kenaz, since Kenazite means son of Kenaz. He, uh, he speaks in verse 6, speaks to Joshua. You know the word which the Lord spoke to Moses, the man of God concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. Of course, Joshua did know what he was speaking of and what the Lord had said and uh, yet to give authority to the request that he is about to make, Caleb recounted the story of how 45 years earlier he and Joshua and the 10 other scouts went into Canaan to explore the land. In verse 7, he begins this re recollection of it. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought back to him as it was, I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt with fear. But I followed the Lord my God fully. Their hearts melted with fear. Well, that's the same reaction that the Canaanites had when they heard that Joshua and Israel crossed the Jordan. In Jericho, we were told their hearts melted. Well, that was the right reaction for those in Jericho. They, they knew what God had done in Egypt and how Israel ran through the Amorite king Sion and Og like a juggernaut. The Canaanites knew this was an invincible army that was coming after them and coming toward them, and they knew that their end was upon them. So it was understandable and right, correct, for their hearts to melt. But Israel is different. Israel had witnessed the Lord's wonders and powers in Egypt for them. And how he drowned Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea to defend them. They'd seen amazing things of the Lord's power and care for them still when the ten faithless spies told them stories about the great cities of Canaan and of a land inhabited by giants, that we were like grasshoppers in their sight, they became faithless like Canaanites. It's in Numbers 13. The people were terrified and, and on the verge of rebellion when Caleb spoke up and said, we should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we will surely overcome it. He stood boldly against the, the tide of public opinion. As he said, he followed the Lord his God fully. So did Joshua. The reason is they believed God's Word. And they believed God's word because they believed in the God of Abraham. Faith was the reason for their courage and their clear thinking. The people didn't believe. 
and responded the way they did to the challenge with weakness and with cowardice. Faith makes people strong and it makes them wise. As a result of the nation's unbelief, the Lord judged that generation and sent it back into the desert to wander in that wilderness for 38 years. But Caleb and Joshua, out of a million people, were singled out for blessing. In Numbers 14 and verse 24, God said, My servant Caleb, because he has had a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land which he entered, and his descendants shall take possession of it. And Caleb repeated the promise in verse 9. He and his children would have as an inheritance the land on which his foot had trodden, where he had walked, because he followed the Lord God fully. God honors those who honor him. 1 Samuel 2, verse 30, Those who honor me I will honor, and those who despise me will be lightly esteemed. They'll be cursed, in other words. It's a hard thing to stand against popular opinion, particularly when you are standing for the Lord against a secular, powerful world of the kind that we live in. It makes you unpopular. It makes you the object of ridicule, or worse. God knows that, knows that better than we know that. And He honors His servants. I don't guess there is any greater testimony that can be given to a person than that which God gave to Caleb. He followed me fully. God honors us when we do that. Blessing and obedience go together. God honored Caleb with entrance into the land and obtaining his inheritance there. So now 45 years later, Caleb had come to Gilgal to claim what God had promised to him. In verse 12, he said, Now then, give me this hill country about which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day that Anakim were there with great fortified cities. Perhaps the Lord will be with me and I will drive them out as the Lord has spoken. Uh, the Anakim were a race of giants. Uh, they were the ones that they had seen when uh, he and the others spied out the land. They terrified the ten, but not Joshua and Caleb. That's what God promised to give him. He promised to give him the hill country in the Negev, the, the dry, rather barren area in Judah where the patriarchs had lived. Literally... What he asked for was that mountain. Now it refers to the hill country, but it does seem to be a specific place, a specific mountain that he was thinking of, that he had in view, and it's later identified in verse 14 as Hebron. That's what God promised to give Caleb. A mountain with a fortified city where giants lived. They were certainly not going to, these giants, not going to move out and let him move in. Uh, he knew what was in store for him. He knew what lay ahead, that he would have to fight those giants in order to take it. But that's what he wanted. What he asked for. It's what God had given to him. It's the inheritance he had promised Caleb the toughest, most challenging place in Canaan. It seemed impregnable. And Caleb was eager to claim it. Now, that's remarkable. Caleb, remember, was 85 years old, well past the age of retirement. But for seven years, he had been fighting battles, and he wasn't, uh, he wasn't ready to stop. Not until he had his inheritance. Not until he had what God had specifically promised to give him. This is the kind of thing 
that uh, people today write books about. Well, not long ago, I read a, a review of a book titled The Impossible First. It's about a man in his 30s who is the first to have hiked across the continent of, Ant continent of Antarctica unaided. So he walked over 900 miles in what is probably the most hostile environment on the globe, pulling uh, his supplies you know, on a sled behind him. It was a remarkable story, at least from the review that I read. It's the kind of thing that this man does. He also is a mountain climber and he climbed Mount Everest. Uh, it's the kind of thing most of us would not even consider doing. And that's why books like that are interesting to us. Well, in, in the review, he is quoted as saying, it all starts with believing in yourself, believing that something is possible. Believing that something is possible is the first step to making it really happen. All of us have a dream, something we might one day hope to do or become. All of us have an Everest. And then he asked, what is your Everest? In other words, what do you really desire to do? What, what is your great unachieved goal in life? You can do it. Nothing is impossible. Set your mind to doing it. It all starts with believing in yourself. Well, men, men like that are an inspiration. I, uh, I don't diminish what uh, he or others like him have done, like Edmund Hillary. Uh, they remind us of the strength of the human spirit and that uh, we can do more than we imagine. I think that is true. I think we are all capable of doing much more than maybe we give ourselves credit for doing. And so they inspire us to be courageous and, and to push on and strive for excellence. Um, we won't do that if we begin thinking that we can't do that. We won't do that if we think there's no use trying, whatever that goal is that we have. So there is something to be said for a positive, can-do spirit. But we would make a mistake if we interpreted Caleb in that light as just an inspirational story of, uh, of what we can do if we only have confidence in ourselves and put our mind to it. He was not such a man. He didn't look to climb mountains and fight giants for the sake of climbing mountains and fighting giants. He had nothing to prove. He was a man of faith. Faith alone was the source of his strength and courage, which means it didn't start with him, but with the Lord. It is about the human, it's not about, I should say, the human spirit, it's about God Almighty. Now, he hadn't underestimated the challenge. Caleb hadn't. He knew he was up against giants, and the giants were real. Nor had he overestimated the Lord. That, that really can't be done. The Lord is always greater than any challenge we might face, and he is greater and was greater than any impediment that Joshua faced or any opponent. He knew that. And so he acted upon that. He acted upon the revelation of God. God promised to give Canaan to Israel. That was God's revelation. He scouted out the land, knowing that that was the promise some 40 years earlier, confident that God would give all of that to Israel, give the giants to them, give their cities into their hand, he was confident because God had revealed that. And he went to war against Hebron because the Lord had promised it to him as his inheritance. He believed God. He walked by faith. He followed God's will, not his own. I think it's important to understand this. When we talk about the life of faith, we're not talking about a life where we get an idea that I ought to walk across Antarctica. And I have faith, and therefore God will bless me. That's not the life of faith. The life of faith is in 
God's revelation, the things He has instructed us to do and the principles of conduct that He has laid out for us. We follow that by faith. If we honor Him in the midst of a hostile world, He will honor us. He's promised to do that. It's taking the things of God that He has promised to us, believing them and acting upon them. Following His will, not our own. Everything he says here, that Caleb says here, is a witness to that. A witness to the sovereign grace of God in his life and his complete trust in it, his complete trust in God and in the Lord God's revelation. In verse 10 he says, he said, Now behold, the Lord has let me live. Now there's sovereign grace right there while others of his generation, family and friends, died all around him, Caleb lived. That was God's will for him. That was God's grace toward him. And that's true for us. Look, every day of your life is a gift of God. And that's what the Word of God says. Acts chapter 17, verse 25, Paul is standing on... Mars Hill, he is speaking to this august company of Greek philosophers, and he tells them that uh, everything they have is a gift from God. They didn't know that. They didn't know the God he was speaking of. It was the unknown God that they had an altar to down in the Agora, in the marketplace. And he, but he said to them, the Lord gives to all people life and breath and all things. The Lord gives breath to everyone. Every breath that you and I take, every moment, is a gift of the sovereign God. But in a time of national judgment, he blessed jo uh, Joshua and Caleb by giving them breath at every moment when he had taken it away from so many others. He gave them life, and he gave them a long life. But now, but not only that, he gave him, he gave Caleb strength. He was 85 years old. And he was as strong that day in Gilgal as he was the day that Moses sent him into the land to scout it out. Verse 11, my strength was, as my strength was then, so my strength is now for war and for going out and coming in. How does a man at 85 have the strength of a young warrior? Well, it's not because he took vitamins and exercised as good and important as that is. I think it's good to take a lot of vitamin C, particularly at this time, at this pandemic. But in, in his case, it was due solely to the sovereign grace of God. Caleb could say what Paul said and wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. That was true of Caleb as well. He acknowledged that here. God made him what he was. So after wandering for 38 years in the wilderness and then fighting a seven-year war of conquest with the Canaanites at the age of 85, he was ready to fight another battle wasn't ready to take his rest. He was ready to fight. That's grace. Now, none of this diminishes the greatness of Caleb. I refer to him as a black swan, as a, an unusual man, a man of faith and virtue, rare, rarely found in any generation. He understood God's sovereignty, and he understood his personal responsibility, and he acted on his responsibility. But he had the courage of his convictions because he understood God and he believed in Him. No genuine understanding of the sovereignty of God, and you hear me preach a lot about the sovereignty of God, no genuine understanding of grace and sovereignty diminishes in any way at all personal responsibility. The saints have personal responsibility 
to believe in all that God has said and act upon it, to live in obedience. It is only to the degree that we know God, understand who He is, that we will do that, that we will trust in Him, believe that He's good for His promises, and then obey Him. So we need to know Him. We need to devote ourselves to knowing Him. That requires a lifetime of study, thought, and prayer to increase in knowledge, knowledge of the mind, and knowledge of experience. Knowledge of what God's Word reveals to us about Him and the knowledge we have by, by way of personal experience in walking with Him. Caleb had that. Caleb was a godly man from a young age, and he became an example of that for the nation. Like Captain Cornelius, to quote the, the preacher, Caleb is a black swan in this generation. If he were here today in this generation, he would be something rare to behold. He's an example for us as he was for those of his own generation. Those that were at Gilgal must have, have been amazed when he said in verse 12, give me this mountain, I want that mountain where the giants live. I say they were amazed, maybe they weren't. They, they may not have been at all surprised because they had been with him for those many years of, of war with the Canaanites. They'd seen the kind of man he was. They'd seen his courage on the battlefield, and they knew his determination to get his inheritance. They saw the grit that was characteristic of this man, his courage, his determination. He wanted his inheritance. He wanted what God had promised him. He didn't have a desire for anyone else's inheritance. He didn't covet other men's hills or houses or fields. He only wanted what God had given him, which was in that barren part of the land in the Negev and that hill where the giants lived. He wanted to possess it and wanted to use it for God's glory. Caleb was a man of faith. There are different <clears throat> aspects of faith. Sometimes faith holds fast in the storm. It trusts the Lord when it seems that all things are against what the Lord has said and what the saint is to do. Still, he or she doesn't doubt. That's the faith that stands firm. Sometimes faith is forward-looking acting and assertive. It knows the promises of God, it believes them, and it acts upon them, boldly stepping out in faith. You see that in some of the old reformers and the missionaries like John Knox and David Livingston. Knox famously prayed, give me Scotland or I die. And he almost did die more than once. He suffered imprisonment and slavery to preach the pure gospel. But he was emboldened by God's sovereignty, saying, one man with God is a majority. Livingston explored sub-Sahara Africa all of his adult life unto his death. And he did so in order to promote commerce on that continent, in order to destroy the slave trade, and in order to spread the gospel. On his tomb in Westminster Abbey is John chapter 10, verse 16. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. That uh, promise that God must bring them and that they shall hear moved Livingston to go far from home, far from comfort, and, and give the gospel in the confidence that the Lord would bless it. He sacrificed all for that. That was Caleb-like. A man who would storm a mountain full of giants because he knew God had given it to him. Therefore, he would prevail. Livingston followed that same path. 
And I think Caleb was eager to fight those giants to prove how wrong his generation was in fearing them, how foolish unbelief is, and to prove to this new generation that had grown up how faithful God is to his word and encourage them to continue on in the fight. That was, for example, the motive of George Mueller and his wife when, as relatively new believers, they devoted their lives to building an orphanage in, in England by prayer only, not by asking people for money. One of Mueller's biographers, A.T. Pearson, called it a great experiment that he set for himself to prove that the prayer which resorts to God only will bring help in every crisis. We can, re we can depend upon the Lord to provide. Just look to Him and trust Him rather than trust in the ways of the world of doing things. And so they made that their object. They made that their goal. They made that their practice. They never made public appeals for money. And they found the Lord always faithful in providing for their needs. It was the same for Hudson Taylor and the China Inland Mission. In fact, these two managed to find out about each other, and Mueller, who had nothing, but what God supplied him was not only to be able to build more than one orphanage and supply food and board and education for these children all through the years, many years, was also able to support the ministry of Hudson Taylor as they were of the same mind about these things. Point is, God's faithful. Mueller and his wife wanted to prove that to the church. They did this specifically, first and foremost, as an experiment to demonstrate God's faithfulness and encourage God's people with that and to strengthen the faith of the church. Now these uh, that I've cited, these examples are spectacular examples of faith, the kind of things uh, that we, re we like to read about, like someone walking across the continent of Antarctica, because it's unusual. And it's kind of heroic. And these are, as I would say, special examples of faith. And not all of us are called to that kind of a life, to begin a ministry like that or to carry on something like that. In fact, life for most of us is lived in the mundane and the daily routine of life. And that's okay because that's where God has called us to be. He called us to live the life that Paul prescribed to the Thessalonian Christians. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 11. That's the Christian life. It's life in the mundane. And, and that provides an important witness to, for the world to see an orderly faithful life in the small things of, of life. It's an important witness because wherever we are, whether at school or at work, whatever place God has placed us in, we are seen by those around us and we are to be a light to those around us in our behavior as well as in our word. People see how we conduct ourselves in times of prosperity and in times of adversity. Our faith is tested in both. Do we help when we can? Do we live with, with an open hand? Generous to people? Are we faithful when we suffer? That's life in the mundane. But it is living like Caleb because it is following the Lord God fully. We'll only be able to do that by knowing God as He is, as sovereign, as good, and as faithful. Something else that uh, characterized Caleb 
that you may have noticed, or you may not have, it's one of these things that's easy to glance over without thinking much of, but something that is very much characteristic of his faith and the knowledge of God's absolute sovereignty. It's in verse 8 when he was recounting how he and Joshua were scouting out the land, and he referred to the faithless ten spies as my brethren or brothers. Now that was very gracious of him. They were scoundrels. They brought wreck and ruin on that generation. But he knew that only by the grace of God, he was not like them. He knew, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Understanding that keeps us humble and gracious. It, it makes us black swans in this generation. Now the chapter concludes with Joshua giving Caleb what he requested and blessing him. He gave Hebron to Caleb for an inheritance. Verse 14, Therefore Hebron became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, until this day, because he followed the Lord God of Israel fully. Now the name of Hebron was formerly Kiriat Arba, for Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. Then the land had rest from war. That's how chapter 11 ended, you may remember. Then the land had rest from war. Literally, the land was quiet. Sometimes the only way to have peace with liberty is by war. Now, this is certainly true of the Christian life, the spiritual life. We have the quiet life by fighting the spiritual war every day which is being active in our faith. It, it's fighting the giants. It's fighting the Anakim of temptation every day. We have the quiet life, the peaceful life, the productive life by living a life of obedient faith. Knowing God's Word, believing it, and doing it. In Colossians two, uh, chapter 3, verse 23 and 24, Paul wrote, Whatever you do, do your work heartily, as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. Caleb wanted his inheritance, and he fought giants to get it. May God give us strength of faith to do the same thing, and fight the fight that Caleb fought in our own day. If you're here without Christ, you have no inheritance, no lasting inheritance. In fact, the Proverbs promise those who rebel will only inherit the wind. Nothing. Now that's terrifying. Nothing. Alone forever. Isolated forever. Darkness forever. Abandonment. That's your inheritance. Come to Christ, the Savior who died in the sinner's place, bore God's eternal wrath for sin so that all who believe in Him and only put their trust in Him, that's all that's required of us, Come to Him so that He would escape that wrath and have everlasting life and glory. Come to Him by faith, by believing. Trust in Christ and live. We've got to help you to do that if you've not, and if you have, help, you help us all, may He, to live a life of obedience and faith, to be warriors in this age for Him. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for uh, the example of this great man, Caleb. Yes, he's a product of your grace. And he recognized that. He acknowledged that. You had given him a long life. You gave him strength physically. You gave him spiritual strength. Everything that he had, everything we have is a gift from you. 
but he acted upon it, and we are to be responsible as well. May we follow that example, and by your grace, may we act upon the instruction you've given us. May we follow the life you've called us to. May we live as warriors in this age, and not with a physical sword, but with the spiritual sword of your word, using it, living according to it, and being a blessing to those around us. We thank you for Christ and what he's done for us and for the life we have by his grace. Thank you for that. Now as we remember him, we pray that you would bless us. May this time of remembrance be a a sanctifying moment for us. We commit it to you and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. You know, it's something of a tradition in our church at this time of the year to encourage undertaking the challenge to read through the Bible in the new year. Seth mentioned that at the beginning of the service. I I only mention it because I've had a habit in this past uh, COVID year to find scripture passages out of each week's readings to uh, refer to at this time in our Sunday meetings when we observe the Lord's Supper. And so that means, if you think about it, I've had occasion this past week to reread the very first presentation of the gospel in the Bible out of Genesis 3.15. You may remember that Dan drew our attention to that passage just very recently. So today, I'll only remind you that it's found, this promise of the gospel is found in the curse God placed upon the serpent in the Garden of Eden after he had tempted Adam and Eve into sin, resulting in the fall of man. And the the almost hidden promise there in in Genesis 3.15 uh, is found in God's curse of the serpent, and, and it revealed God's plan to save a people for himself out of their sin. And the promise was that in putting enmity between the serpent and the woman, and most noteworthy between the serpent seed and the woman's seed, the future seed of the woman who we know to be the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, he would ultimately crush the head of the seed of the serpent. Well, that scene occurred long, long ago. Uh, it was, as I said, it's, it's related in the third chapter of the Bible. But the seed of the woman did appear. Paul, the apostle, wrote in Galatians 4 that when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. When Jesus spoke to his disciples the night before he went to the cross, and he took the bread of the supper, and he said to them, Uh, This is my body. He was encouraging them to remember and and to pass on to the ages to come, including us uh, today, that he had come in the flesh, uh, the seed of the woman, in order to crush the head of Satan and deliver his people from the penalty for their sin so that we might live instead. The context of his remarks at the table that evening was sin and what he was going to do about their sin. And therefore, he told them, this is my body given for you. And later, he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. And that shed blood was another almost hidden element. Dan mentioned it a few weeks ago in the garden there in Genesis 3 when the Lord God killed animals in order to provide the covering for the naked Adam and Eve, symbolically bearing witness to this future shedding of blood that would cover our sins. Well, we celebrate that this morning in this memorial supper, bearing in mind that Jesus, when he inaugurated the Lord's Supper, said, do this in remembrance of me. So I invite, we invite uh, all of you who are here today, and you can say that he died for me, 
and I live by faith in him. That's been the theme of, of the sermon this morning. We invite you to participate with us now uh, as we partake of the bread, and I'll give thanks now for the bread. Lord, thank you for uh, this element that reminds us symbolically uh, that uh, the seed of the woman did come. Uh, very God of very God became a very man of very man, and he stood in our place. A man standing in the place of other human beings, taking the penalty for our sin because he knew no sin, and yet you made sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Thank you for this moment, this time that we have together, uh, the four, first Lord's Supper of 2021. I pray, Lord, that in the hearts of your saints this morning, we might revere him. In Jesus' name, amen. Before I give thanks for the cup, I'm going to read 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, make a few comments on it. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, made alive in the spirit. At first glance, the statement that Christ died once for all, died once for sins may sound a little surprising. Um, not, and, and a little bit odd, I guess, because we all die once. How else could one die? But it has to be seen in light of the Jewish sacrificial system in which animals, lambs and bulls and goats were continually offered up for sin. The, sacrifice, the sacrifices of the Day of Atonement were made each year, year after year after year for centuries. But Christ's death, which was a sacrificial death, was once for all. It ended all sacrifices and the sacrificial system. It did what those bulls and goats and lambs could not do. It made atonement for sin. It satisfied God's wrath, put away our sin, and brought us to God. And there's an implication in that that's very important, and that is there's nothing more that we can do to have peace with God and a relationship with Him. Nothing more that we can do. Nothing we can add to that. Christ has done it all. He's an all-sufficient Savior. He solved the sin problem and gained eternal life for His people by His death, His sacrificial death. All a person can do is receive that through faith and faith alone. Rest in that and rejoice in Christ. This reminds us of that. So let's give thanks for the cup that speaks of his death, that speaks of his sacrifice in our place. Father, we thank you for this cup that does signify your son and what he's done for us. And all that we have in him, you solved the sin problem through him. You obtained forgiveness for us and life for us through his death, which paid for all of our sins, took away our guilt, paid the price, paid our debts. We're paid up in full through Him. We thank You for His all-sufficient work. Bless us as we consider what He has done and who He is. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's close with a benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance on you and give you peace. Until next week, keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. Have a great day and a good week. <laughs>